So um, we had discussed the uh, resolution versus variance trade-off. We're on page 98 now uh, at the end of notes 10. Um, I uh, would like to discuss the power spectrum of noise. I think there are several surprises here that uh, we need to pay some attention to. Um, I may rush a little bit because we're right at, uh, you know, today is the first lecture of the second half of the class. And I probably should be moving on to um, notes uh, 12, but uh, let me see how far I can get. And uh, we will certainly be hitting the second half of the class, the introduction to seismic imaging um, this week. So, um, uh, you know, looking at spectra is a time honored way of analyzing time series. Um, we would, we would like to characterize a data series by its spectral peaks, right? And um, uh, where we have strong peaks in the spectra, we think, OK, there must be some periodic process operating here, right? A peak in the spectra means that there's a lot of energy that is at, at one period, and that's giving us strong evidence that uh, there's a, uh, uh, that the data is affected by a strongly periodic process. Um, why is that interesting? Well, uh, periodic processes can more easily be connected to um, uh, to physical causality, to physical causes than than a process that has a broad spectrum. Okay, and is not strongly peaked. Um, one example is uh, some years ago, um, paleontologists who were assembling. Um, numbers of species within each geological period, uh, and that's so you have a time series. You know the diverse, the number, of the diversity of species in uh, uh, through geologic time. They did a Fourier transform and uh, and got a spectrum, and noticed that it had a peak at 26 million years. Okay, now that's uh, not connected to any of the Milankovitch cycles uh, that affect. Uh, climate. Um, it's, a, it's a smaller, um, uh, it's a, you know, there's a, there's a low in the number of species every 26 million years, so, you know, approximately. You know, so they saw a peak and, and then they interpreted it. Um, I, I'm going to talk about uh, here, you know, what, you know, how much of a peak do you have to see for it to, for, for you to really be able to call this the spectrum uh, periodic, okay, uh, or the time called the time series periodic. You know what should the characteristics of that peak be to uh, uh, to stand out above the noise and to be indicating some kind of correlation that then you can go and search for a mechanism for, or can you have spectral peaks that are simply spurious that are a product of the noise, okay? And how do you tell the two apart? And it. It's going to turn out that there's an extremely simple criterion that almost nobody honors when they when they write about spectral peaks. Okay, and um, uh, so I want to present that to you here, and in, in hopes that you will have occasion to use it in your work later on. Um, because uh, you know all data sets are noisy, and the addition of random noise always does alter the shape. Uh, of, of spectral peaks, and it always does introduce false peaks. And so this is an issue that you have to evaluate on your particular time series and your particular spectrum before you can go and say, well, this peak is, is important, or it might mean something. It could be entirely spurious. Now, in the case of the, the paleontologists um, and evolutionary biologists, all right, with their, uh, their I, I don't know the quality, actually, of their 26 uh, million year spectral peak. Um, but they, uh, as a result, proposed that there is this nemesis star that the sun is, you know, it's a, the sun is really a binary system. And, and there's a far away star, um, you know, probably not Alpha Centauri, but farther than that. And the, 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 the sun and, uh, and this nemesis star you know, get get close to each other every uh, 26 million years, uh, and I, I I don't know how to make the astronomical calculation for you know the radius of the orbit and all that sort of thing uh, that would 
that would come out with a period of 26 million years, but uh, that's what they uh, that's what they proposed. And then, of course, you know, you have the gravitational field of a uh, another star interfering with our asteroid belt and our uh, and and the uh, the other objects in our solar system, you know, canting the Earth a little bit off its off its own orbit, um, and uh, that could definitely bring about uh, uh, every 26 million years very large asteroid impacts. Uh, that would then, you know, wipe out the dinosaurs and uh, wipe out uh, um, other species uh, two times even in the mid tertiary. So uh, uh, that's a uh, that's a proposal, and uh, I think uh, the search for the Nemesis star has not turned up anything. I mean, there's only so many stars that are close enough. Um, so uh, uh, and and all their orbits are are known now. So perhaps that is an example of a spurious peak. Okay. Now, um, how to uh, how to separate spurious peaks from uh, that are due to uh, uncorrelated noise? Okay, uh, that are due and, and that noise we are we are calling uh, stochastic. We believe it's due to a random process. Okay. So the, those. Uh, 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 those spurious peaks are, are due to the noise component of the data, or as we're assessing here, the stochastic part of our data. That's that's really our statistical model. Okay, uh, and if we if we take a, a random series, so a totally stochastic series x of t, okay, it's going to have a spike autocorrelation. All right, uh, the autocorrelation is going to be um, and, and you'll see in a second, sigma squared valued at, um, at zero uh, lag uh, and zero everywhere else for every other lag, positive or negative, okay, if it's a truly random series. The, uh, the value of the uh, autocorrelation R sub at, at lag k is the expectation of uh, the expected product, okay, of uh, x at t times x at t plus k, all right, and so coming in with the uh, the definition of the expectation, okay, uh, it's the limit as the number of samples goes to infinity of one over n the number of samples, and and summing over everything uh, having to you know avoid summing past the number past big n, but and that's all that's that that's about. Um, and we have uh, x sub i times x uh, at i plus k. Okay. Now, for i not equal to, um, let's see. Yeah, sorry. This is this is an error. For for k not equal to zero, right? So so we got x at i, and we have x at somewhere else. Okay, if k is not equal to zero, then um, then we have you know we are defining that we have an uncorrelated data series. Okay, and um, uh, so it gives it gives us zero. Okay, this limit will give us zero uh, for uh, an uncorrelated data series for any value of k other than zero. Okay, when k is zero, then what we have is the expectation of x. At t squared, and of course, that is uh, uh, we know that, that that that's our r zero, that's our expect that's our uh, autocorrelation at zero lag, and and uh, what is that? You know, that's an, the expectation. If you remember, it's it's the uh, uh, it's the uh, uh, ensemble sum, uh, ensemble average, and of course uh, that is sigma squared. Okay, r zero is sigma squared. The, uh, the standard deviation squared, uh, because this is just this is not the deterministic part. This is you know x is a purely random series. All right, so it has a variance, okay, and uh, and that's what r zero is at zero lag, and uh, and here's that Kronecker delta, okay. Well, del we'll just call it uh, delta at k, all right, and so it's zero everywhere but k equals zero. So that is a that is this spike. All right, and we're just using the definition of of this theoretical thing that we 
that we have called uh, uncorrelated noise. All right. Um, okay, now the power spectrum is the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation. So for the theoretical random series, you know that that all these nice things apply to, and that I could do this analysis of above for that theoretical random series, um, the uh, the the spectrum is has the value of sigma squared for all frequencies. Okay, it's a perfect spike. It's a perfect delta function, and it's scaled by sigma squared. All right, and so the the uh, uh, the Fourier transform is a constant. The spectrum is a constant sigma squared. All right. So the power spectrum is sigma squared. It's a constant. So um, theoretically, uh, you know, uh, according to this, you know, no matter how complex or squirrely our data spectrum, the uh, all that all that. Uh, Adding random noise is going to do is it's going to lift that spectrum. It's going to bias the spectrum by this sigma squared. Okay, so you have you know whatever details and squirrely things you've got, you know peaks that may or may not be real within your data spectrum. Okay, and you add noise to that signal, and uh, uh, and it just perfectly lifts, you know evenly lifts all of the. Uh, you know, every single spectral value is just going to get sigma squared added to it. It's going to lift it up. And so, so that's not going to interfere in the interpretation of the spectrum, right? This, you know, you can still you got the same spectral shapes. You know, the 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 rate the, the uh, well maybe the ratio changes, but still the the difference you know from one frequency to another is not going to change. Okay, so because you know we. Uh, 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 we we we've just lifted the spectrum by the by the variance. Okay, trouble is this doesn't work. Okay, uh, and and of course the reason why is because we never have infinite data. We never have, you know, this this is the spectrum. This flat line is the spectrum of an infinitely long time series, right? N going to infinity. Okay. And um, you know, I'm sure the data sets you guys are going to be looking at uh, look pretty infinite, but you know, you can store them on a computer; they're not infinite. All right. Uh, so, um, uh, all right, we have finite data. N is finite. N is not infinite. Big N. Okay. All right. Well, we we've. What is our best estimate of the of the autocorrelation of X? Okay, given a finite and big N data samples. Okay, so our autocorrelation estimate, you know, we got to call it R hat because it's not what we wanted. It's what we got, uh, and it's one over N. Okay, the same sum, X at T uh, times X at T plus the lag K. Okay. Um, in the best case, you know, here's uh, uh, here's what it is. I'm right at the bottom of notes number ten now. Um, in the best case, uh, r hat is n minus k over n uh, times one over the quantity n minus k, and then here's the same sum. All right. So. You know, this is not zero, not not by any means. Okay. Um, and and for k equals zero, all right, it's really no simpler, right? R R naught hat, right? That's the autocorrelation at zero lag, one over n. Okay, sum of uh, uh, x at t times x at t plus k. Now, what is this? You know, it's going to be sigma squared, sure. But it could be it, it's going to have something added or subtracted from it, right? This uh, sigma squared over square root of n, right? That's always positive, but it could be added or subtracted randomly, right? Totally randomly added or subtracted could change from positive to negative at uh, you know from one time sample to the next, from one frequency sample to the next, from one lag to the next. Okay, so the uh, there's a variance now on the variance, and this added variance is 
is, as you can see, inversely proportional to that, you know, beat your head against the brick wall, square one over square root of, well, per inversely proportional to the square root of n. Okay? That, that, that horrible diminishing returns factor. Okay? That, that we just cannot fight. Um, because fight it and you lose. Um, OK, so here we're at the top of notes 11. And um, we have, uh, all right, so we have for k equals 0, right? We have a uh, randomly variable uh, variance that comes out for uh, r hat uh, at 0 lag. And uh, now r hat at non 0 lag k, OK, it's going to be uh, 0 plus or minus n minus k over n times sigma squared. Um, over the square root of, uh, of the quantity n minus k, all right? And, um, and what this boils down to, of course, is this uh, scale. And you can see this is kind of like, um, I mean, it does decrease with increasing lag k, right? It does, you know, it, it, this, this scale factor in front of, of the variance sigma squared, it, it is decreasing. It's no less random, right? Because there's plus or minus taken here, you know, from lag to lag, from frequency to frequency, from time to time, you know, it it you don't know whether it's going to be plus added or subtracted. Okay, so you have uh, uh, square root of n minus k. All right, at very large k, at, at k is very close to n, right? You the, you're going to be down to sigma squared, but at any other k, it's uh, you know, it's really. Doesn't that look like a uh, you know say k is zero right? It looks just like uh, one over square root of n, very simply. So there's no escaping that uh, you know beat your head against the brick wall um, um, uh, uh, diminishing returns factor square one over square root of n. Okay, so uh, here's what it looks like. Okay. Um, your autocorrelation, yeah, it's it's larger at uh, uh, at zero lag, uh, and it's uh, you know it's it's going to have a variance of its own. You know, here's uh, sigma squared, and it could be uh, you know sigma squared over over square root of n less than that. It could be sigma squared over square root of n greater than that. Okay, and then uh, you're going to have non-zero. Um, you're going to have non-zero. Uh, values in the um, uh, in in the um, uh, for the non-zero lags, okay, and they're going to be varying between minus and plus sigma squared over square root of n, right? Which is going to decrease uh, slowly. Uh, no, no, it's it's uh, well, it it will decrease slowly when you get uh, out towards uh, k equal to uh, n. Uh, and, and and here uh, you know for large n you know here's what here's what it, what it's going to get to, right? Uh, one over square root of n uh, sigma squared. So uh, the the fluctuations for uh, non-zero lags k die out very slowly with increasing n, and only as uh, you know again the the beat your head against the wall um, one over square root of n. Okay, so let's uh, estimate the power spectrum of this uh, of this complicated and very random um, complicated and very random um, autocorrelation. Well, comp it's a it's a random uncorrelated series X, and uh, we've gotten a rather complicated and, and still incredibly random uh, autocorrelation, and now we take its Fourier transform to get the power spectrum. Okay, so uh, we have r hat k times e to the i omega k, uh, and we're uh, we're uh, summing over k, right? This is the the discrete Fourier transform of that r hat. Okay, and um, uh, what we what comes out is, uh, and this is you know the spectrum uh, p hat, right? This is the spectrum we get, not the one we wanted. It's going to be about equal to sigma squared. Oh, you say, whew, that's, you know, that's what I wanted, right? The sigma squared is what I wanted, but there's this added stuff, OK? Um, uh, sigma squared over uh, square root of n, 
okay, times the sum of signum function sigma, and this is signum function of uh, of r of r hat, right? And r hat is going positive and negative randomly, okay. And so the signum function times that is is going to be crazy, right? And that's going to be uh, adding from frequency to frequency. That's going to be adding, you know, positive or negative uh, cosines and sines. All right. So uh, you know we're we're still we're still stuck in this in this highly uh, random um, functional environment. Now, approximately. You know the signal function has a mean zero, variance one. So um, <clears throat> uh, you know we can we can uh, uh, try to take that out. Um, you know the the uh, an approximation of the uh, of the uh, Fourier transform of the of the autocorrelation is sigma squared. Okay, that's good. Plus or minus square root of n over square root of n uh, times sigma squared. But we just can't reduce it further than this at the bottom here. Okay. That spectrum is going to be equal to sigma squared at every frequency, but pretty much plus or minus. Uh, it's going to be one plus or minus one. So it's going to randomly vary between zero times and two times sigma squared. Okay. Um, this is all pretty strange, and you know we have to we have to take some broad you know approximations with our with our algebra. Because we, you know, there's no way that we can we can handle the, uh, you know, a, a close. There's no closed form expressions that can handle the the random nature of of uh, our our input uh, stochastic data. So uh, um, let me let me make sure that it's perfectly understandable what we've what we've um, what we found here. The power spectrum of random noise is. Complex and 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 it's not a complex number. What it is is complicated. Okay, I should say complicated, and looks like random noise itself. It it basically looks like squared random noise. Okay, it's all positive, of course, uh, but it can go to zero, and and you know, uh, fairly often does. All right, and, and as you add more samples, it doesn't get any. You know, as you try to go to that limit. The trouble is, you always you, you can't add an infinite amount of data. So so, as you add more samples, the power spectrum of noise just gets more complex. Okay, it doesn't help you at all. It never smooths out. Okay. Um, so so you have large n, and and here's your here's your random um, your your random noise series. Okay, and it's 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 varying from you know, minus to plus sigma. Okay, all right. So it's got variance sigma squared. Okay, perfectly random. I mean, I, I shouldn't even be able to connect it with with uh, lines like this, but you know, I can try. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, uh, then um, uh, basically the power spectrum looks like the square of that. It's just as complicated, just as noisy. Okay. As the original data series, here's that two sigma squared level, and it only reaches it occasionally. But you know you can't you can't tell whether it's uh, uh, whether it's uh, 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 you really can't tell whether whether it's um, going to be at that or not or at zero or you know or where in between. Who knows? You know it's totally unpredictable. So the the unpredictable Stochastic data gives you an unpredictable stochastic spectrum. Okay, the only thing you can say about it is that it's somewhere between zero and two sigma squared. That's all you can say. Two sigma squared. Okay, remember that. Um, okay, so uh, uh, now you have no doubt taken spectra yourself. Okay, and. Uh, and you might be thinking, you know, sitting here saying, "Well, you know, when I when I took my, you know, I clipped out uh, pieces of waveforms that were 500 points long, and I got some some spectra that were uh, 256 points long, and uh, didn't look like random noise." Okay, so consider <clears throat> consider what happens. Okay, all right, we have 
here you have a large n, large, a large amount of random noise. Okay? Um, and if you, if you clip out a window of you know, just the first tenth of it, all right, what you've done there is you, in the time domain, you have multiplied by a boxcar okay, around, um, <clears throat> around, uh, 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 around zero time. Okay? And you're uh, uh, at larger, at, you know, beyond the time, of the, the time your boxcar ends, okay, you have imposed zero data. Okay? And, and so, I mean, that's a huge assumption, right? The series is random for this, uh, for this defined time, and then after that, which you say, well, I don't have any more data than that, you've actually, uh, you've actually put in the brash assumption that those samples, that, that noise is zero. Okay? So, and and that's, the, um, <clears throat> that's, the, that's the, the, the hard lesson about, um, about limiting your data. Okay? Uh, we're going to see in the next half of the class how it's a very hard lesson because we can only acquire seismic data over a certain, you know, array size. You know, even if even if I have one of those systems where I can record twenty thousand channels at once, and I'm, I'm sure there's a fifty thousand channel system out there now. Okay, I'm still going to have the ends of my array, and beyond the end of the array, of the array, there is nothing there. But zero, and all the processes that we're using are assuming that those data are zero, which is obviously false. Okay, there really are waves out there beyond the end of the array, and 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 you know you shut you shut off recording and you get your well you know we never shut off recording in our seismic network right, uh, but you know we get to the we we say all right you know uh, ten minutes of data that's enough for our for our event set, okay. And it's zero after that. Okay, well that's all the data we have. It's zero after that, and and we know that's not true. You know the the waves still continue to arrive after that. There still continues to be noise after that. Um, so this is the the hard lesson. All right, if we if you uh, <clears throat> and you can do this in uh, you can do this in um, um, in FT. Uh, I'm sorry, in uh, FFT lab. Okay, you can you can uh, you know poke in a uh, uh, a kind of random series, okay, uh, you know try to make as random a series as you can, and um, and you can and you'll see it's it's Fourier transform, and it'll look like a random series, and then you know go through and zero out the last three quarters of it, and and then you do the Fourier transform again, and it looks smooth. Okay, why does it look smooth? Okay, what are, what, are, what are we really doing? All right. Well, we are multiplying by a boxcar in time. Okay, from zero to our time width w. Okay, we have you know maybe sigma, and then uh, and then beyond w, it's zero. Okay, the autocorrelation of this boxcar is a triangle. The power spectrum of this boxcar is this sinc function. Okay, we are multiplying in the in the time domain, we are convolving in the um, <clears throat> well. Actually, the power spectrum is a sinc squared function, but we're 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 convolving by a sinc function unsquared in the in the Fourier domain. Okay, what happens when you convolve by a sinc? You're you're gonna essentially low pass filter. Okay, it has taken this complexity and smoothed it out. But all of these peaks, right? It was random noise that we smoothed out. All these peaks are spurious, totally spurious. Okay, we got a smoother result by adding more random noise. <clears throat> I'm sorry, we got a smoother result by by limiting our time. Okay, but it's a, it's it's totally a false assurance. Okay, all every peak in here is spurious. It's Purely random. Every trough is spurious. Okay, so it's just a you know it's just a low it's just low pass it's still random noise it's just low pass filtered noise that's all. Try it out in in uh, in FFT lab. Um, let me know if I if it if it does work like that. I haven't tried it myself. 
Okay. Here's uh, here's uh, the the upshot of this discussion here. The only reliable way to distinguish signal from noise is to observe spectral peaks above the two sigma squared level. Okay, that's the only way. Uh, you 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 know you're going to have this this spectrum. It may be smooth. It may not be, but you can't believe anything that's below two sigma squared. Okay, and and so you know you see a spectrum in a paper, and they identify a peak, and they say, well, this this is suggesting you know the Nemesis star. All right, you you know as a reviewer of that paper, your first question should be, how do I know that that peak is standing above two times sigma squared? Okay, um, you know how do I know that? And uh, so they've got to you know when you when you publish a spectrum. And identify peaks, you've got to you've got to make an assessment. What is sigma, okay? And uh, and you've got to be careful. Um, uh, don't uh, uh, you know? Um, uh, you know, don't don't try to interpret peaks that are below two sigma squared, okay? Uh, and and uh, uh, you know, if if I'm reviewing a paper by you. Um, um, you know that that makes that mistake. I'll you know I'm going to point it out, and and I'm not going to want that paper to be published until uh, until the until it's fixed. Um, now they'll never send me a, a they'll never send me one of your papers to review because because they'll know who I am. Um, but um, uh, and I and I would certainly point it out nicely. I'd probably write directly to you and say, hey, <laughs> you better fix this. Um, but uh, um, you know, in your uh, in your own um, in your own work, you know, be very careful. Uh, and and there are you know even even the Bolton Seismological Society and even in in uh, the journal Geophysics, where everybody's supposed to know this. You know, you still people still get papers through with uh, without you know justifying the peaks that they're interpreting, without without e even measuring sigma squared. Um, and uh, uh, you know, and and you you in your career you will probably review papers for those uh, uh, for those journals, and uh, I'm hoping that you'll you'll watch out. Do people ever like add data at the end, like randomly, like a noise according to what you've already collected in order to extend the time series? Yeah, there's a lot of work on that. Yeah. Um, uh, some of the work on that has been. Um, Called uh, spectral whitening, you know that's that's to keep the uh, the 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 spectrum itself looking random, you know, even where even where you don't have you don't have good good data. Yeah, um, um, it's a it's a time honored um, it's a it's a time honored uh, um, activity. Um, it's it's not going to help this uh, spectral problem, right? Um, well, yeah, yeah, maybe it would, right? Because you know you're most in danger when your spectrum looks smooth, like down here. Okay, if you're if you, if the noise is coming out with you've got enough noise that you have a very complicated spectrum. Okay, then uh, yeah, you know uh, peaks that are due to uh, to um, uh, you know like earthquake source processes should be much smoother. And um, uh, and and they should stand out, okay? Or or you know what you what you'd usually get is is uh, <clears throat> you know you'll get this very complicated spectrum, and but it will it will take uh, excursions above the the two sigma squared level, okay? So. Uh, you know, so you do an average, and you'll find that there is some part of the spectrum sticking up above two sigma squared, and, and that you know that's going to be true for nice, clean seismic recordings. But but I you know I want to know, okay, you know when you interpret a phenomenon, if and I can't it, you know the best thing of course is if I can see it in the raw data, 
And that's probably why my refraction microtremor paper got published at all, was because I pointed out that you could see the velocity of the Rayleigh waves right in, in raw data, you know, with nothing done to it. So, you know, that that was helpful in, in convincing people. But if you're if you're doing a, a spectral analysis and you're getting something out that's that's hidden in the raw data, then you've uh, uh, you know the onus is on you to uh, to to show that. That the the sigma squared level is not a problem, and, and in most of our modern seismic recordings, in most of our modern earthquake seismic recordings, it is not a problem. Actually, that's that's one reason why we still know so little about the uh, the the seismicity underneath um, um, Las Vegas Valley, because the noise level is still a big problem in Las first stations in Las Vegas Valley. There's so much urban noise, and there's so much screening of the earthquake waves by, by the soft sediments in the deep basin, that it's still a problem. Um, so it's a problem for us in our network. And then, of course, uh, uh, you know, you go out to farther offsets with exploration data or deeper depths, and 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 you know, the the signal to noise ratio becomes one to one, and that's where you're going to be be losing your your ability to to make conclusions from spectra as well. Um, so uh, uh, you know, tracking the noise this this really gives uh, uh, it gives you a feel for the importance of tracking the noise. Okay, um, I can uh, I can combine all of these factors into one you know theory of everything, right? Uh, one grand trade off. Okay. Um, so the bandwidth in frequency delta omega times the time span uh, delta t times the um, the variance in the spectrum over the spectrum squared, okay, is uh, the power spectrum. Uh, that product is going to be greater than one. So here's a, here's a you know all the rules we've talked about so far. Uh, combine, you know, and that's because of the relationship of the uh, of the mean to the uh, spectrum. Okay, um, so uh, uh, this is uh, this is basically how how you can do it. You know why? You know to get more accurate time to better identify spectral peaks. You know, say to uh, identify site effects or 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 to look at um, um, uh, source processes. In in uh, earthquake seismology, you know, we had to go to broadband. This is why everybody went to broadband because we needed a bigger delta omega because we wanted smaller delta t, we wanted smaller delta p. All right, and uh, uh, and and you know, going to broadband helps us do that. Uh, in in exploration, right? We're we're always fighting. Uh, you know, we're trying to get those small waves that haven't quite been taken out by uh, um, by uh, uh, intrinsic attenuation, um, and we really do have pretty short recordings. Uh, so uh, uh, you know, we're we're fighting a, a narrower band. We're fighting a um, uh, a smaller time span. Um, you know, and this and this this very trade off limits you know what we can do um, and what we can conclude. Um, okay, I'd better stop there, and uh, I'll continue at the end of the first part of the class uh, in number 11 tomorrow. <laughs>